big day of sheep wrangling coming up on Friday. Nice. Check them all over. Make sure they're doing okay. I don't know why, but I pictured you in the Bo Peep dress with the little hook. <laughs> I mean, oh my god, so we moved all the like... Actually, speaking of <laughs> well, which... Well, kind of. Um, <laughs> you guessed my Halloween costume. We're moving all the, like, the pullets into the like, more winter winter housing. And so we had to like wrangle them all. And I have this poultry crook I made, which is a little like kind of hook of wire on like a six foot ash pole. And anyway, so I was feeling, thank you, Elliot. I was feeling very Bo Peep. Excellent. With my crook. I support this. Thank you. I just need the, uh, I just need the dress. Yeah. The frillier the sleeves, the better. But that can be arranged. You know, I already have the crook. Yes. I already have the animals. I have a sheep one. You're halfway there. It's not like you need an excuse, but it is right around the corner. Yep. There we go. Mm. Anyway. Happy belated Halloween. This is in like March. Is that when this is coming out? Something like that. Oh, man. Yeah, we're we're way ahead of the curb right now. So uh, welcome back, everyone. We're just so good. We're so good. We're recording like five months in advance. My name is Andy, and I'm here with my dapper co-hosts, future vigilantes, Elliot and Matt. So Matt, that fertilizer, that pile behind you, looking a little small. You been busy? What you been doing? Hey, hey, man, I've I've got crops. I've got crops. Just fertilizing stuff. Just fertilizing stuff. And winter. Yeah. Never heard of a cover crop. Jesus Christ. Yeah, making America green again. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Okay. Well, that's my other venture. Yeah. So uh, we're here for part three of our little history on the the permanent agriculture movement in the twentieth century. Ooh. We left off last episode long, long ago, talking about how uh, there was a little bit of splintering going on around advocates for a new food system. That was from the the slightly racist Nashville agrarians. You said slightly. Okay, very racist, correct. From those folks to J. Russell Smith and Elliot's favorite, Sexy Rexy, who can tug well. Jesus Christ. uh, Who was working, building this idea of like small communities of homesteaders, right? And there were uh, there were like a million visions about what sustainable agriculture looked like in response to the ecological destruction that had basically decimated the Midwest and the major watersheds. If the Roaring Twenties uh, had kind of like showcased the the gluttony of unchecked capitalism, that what we saw in the Thirties was like the hangover of that, the reality of the need for something a little bit more structured, right? The idea of like planned economies at this point kind of seems like inevitable. It had to be, it was, it was the counterweight to what we had experienced. And like the early stages of the Soviet Union kind of pointed that like this was something that could happen. And our man, Sexy Rexy, was uh, the man with power to turn that idea into policy, basically. We really can't come up with a better name for this guy, like, uh, Tugosaurus Rex. No. Although that does sound devious. It sounds horrifying. Tugosaurus Rex. I think, I think it's worse. I think I'm pretty sure it's worse. <laughs> hey, Dom, can we get a good sound effect for that? No pressure, but I, I just want to know what that sounds like. Actually, as long as it's not porn, I feel like I need to like put a caveat in there. Like, I, don't, I do not want to hear the thing it could sound like. No, just, if that just makes something sense. good from uh, Jurassic Park. I was thinking the Godzilla screen. Mm-hmm. That works. Rar. In his view, our buddy Rex, as I'll call him Thank for God. our sake, <laughs> monocrops and like the 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 way conventional agriculture had developed had become like a modern serfdom, and he called for the withdrawal of public lands being used for this idea of like individual homesteads through the Homestead Acts and demanded an end to overgrazing on public lands, while also pushing for the restoration of. The lands are just marginally productive. Okay, so like big old school conservation work sort of vibes. Yeah, pull people off the land, save it by, you know, full protections from humans, mm-hmm. right? Even though he pushed this idea of homesteads, he didn't like the idea of people just like being out doing their own thing. It was, we have to do it like the Soviets, like this very standardized yeah, you're homesteading, but you're homesteading in a community of homesteaders, right? And his vision was basically that. It was small-scale manufacturing as, like, your urban hub 
with small villages that were interwoven into this idea with like public transportation. And the idea was that basically individuals would like work part time because of, you know, increased efficiency, just like today where we don't need to work 40 hours a week, or we probably could not, but you know, so it goes. So people would work these like part time jobs and they would otherwise spend their free quote unquote time stewarding subsistence plots. And the government would like, like the extension programs provide that like cutting edge, new age research and resources for these homesteads. And the idea was that we would do this, all this stuff, while also switching land from like regional monocultures to regionally designated like food forest kind of stuff, like tree, fruit, and like grassland agriculture. Okay, I'm going to take a, a little bit of step and say, I mean, this sounds, this sounds kind of good. This sounds kind of nice. I'm not sure how I feel about everyone growing their own food. I know it's just a subsistence plot. It's not like they're growing all of the food that they need. But like, what about people who physically can't do it or the people that just flat out don't like it? Or what if they're just not good at it? Like they don't have a green thumb like me. Like, is there some sort of special formula to specialization? Like, I, I don't know these things. Yeah. I mean, I I think with these things like super devil in the details, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's very different to say people can grow food if they want to and giving them the resources versus, like, commanding it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Like, the power dynamic is really important in this because if I don't want to grow food or whatever... I shouldn't have to. Right. Like if I'm good at if I'm good at something else that isn't growing food, why if I want to, why wouldn't I be able to just go do more of that instead, right? Mm-hmm. But I I guess like putting it in the context of like when this program was, it does provide like a good like counterweight to homestead acts like claiming your 40 and like just getting it in with row crops. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a better alternative than the idea of like removal of people from the landscape and just like scalable industrial agriculture, right? Yeah. But that said, like this vision that he had was like wildly optimistic, right? Like, what are you going to do? Start leveling subdivisions and neighborhoods and cities and whatever to like make this picture that he had in his head like happen? The reality is that like not only did it, was it like wildly optimistic, but like, Considering the context, most people that were even in urban spaces were only removed from traditional agriculture by, like, at most a generation or two. So the idea of, like, repainting what agriculture looks like to people that had spent generations farming was kind of a tough sell, right? Because they they knew what farming was like. And in many cases, they left it because they didn't like it. Further, the other issue is that, like, this vision of what farming should look like or what food systems should look like didn't really deal with, like, the issues of that minute. So you've got farmers that they can't pay their bills, right? This doesn't help them. And they were being subsidized by the same government that Rex represented, right? So the idea is that he couldn't really stop conventional agriculture while also perpetuating it by, like, giving money to farmers for growing like this. And also like this idea of like perennial food systems, that's great, but planting a row of hazelnuts or black walnuts today doesn't deal with the issues of today, right? So trying to balance these two things was like basically impossible. Sounds like our uh, our brother in Christ Rex needs to uh, learn about dual power. Sexy brother in Christ. Yeah. Man, I thought it was going to be a listener that canceled us, but the plot twist is it's going to be me. I'm going to do it. I think it would be a mercy. Mercy kill? I really do. This is like Halo? Talk, talking of brothers like... in Christ, it will... Yeah. He's about to be Abel, and I'm raising Cain over here. Is that the right one? Did I get those right? Or I'm pretty I... sure I'd be Cain. I can't remember which one killed Cain which. killed his brother Abel. Cain? Oh. Okay. Read a book. Well, I will happily be... Read, read a book. Read the you book, know what? Andy. The book. The, all right. You know what? It's time for a commercial. I'm going to go read the book. When you fly, fly with us. Enjoy our panoramic windows, fresh fish, and nonstop flights to Ireland. United Airlines. 
Where everywhere bears care, we fare with flair. Find out more at poorprose.com. And we're back, everyone. Welcome. I uh, really enjoyed that Bible commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Buy all your Bibles through us. Only ninety nine ninety nine plus shipping. All right. So we're not quite done talking about Rex, Rexy, Rexosaurus, Sexosaurus Rex. Move on. Yeah. Okay. What was particularly important about like all of his vision, right? Like it was, it was vastly optimistic and so on. But what's really interesting is that he really tried to center a really early stage understanding of ecology as a, a philosophy at the center of this movement. So like ecology at this time didn't really exist as a science. Like people didn't really understand nature in that context, right? Like obviously people knew that like nature was complicated. And like botany and biology existed, but like ecosystem function, ecological ecological function didn't really have much depth to it. It became like really obvious that like as ecosystems began to collapse, developing like a concrete science behind the ecology to understand why it's working or not working became really important. And the idea of ecology really started to grow in the 1930s. Yeah, and it's absolutely wild that ecology is such a new field of science when it literally should be the oldest science because farming is when the evolution of the human race sort of took a turn. I think I read that somewhere. Uh, it was either that or a monkey ate a magic mushroom in the stone ape theory. But what if the monkey cultivated the shrooms? I'm just imagining like a bunch of chimpanzees working now on like one of those really uh, psychedelic mushroom farms. Where it's just like some some greenhouse out in the woods, totally manned by monkeys. Love Pretty it. sure they're doing that now. Yeah, they're just not telling us. They've reached the stone age. <laughs> I feel like this is like a metaphor, the same way like the if you put a bunch of monkeys in a room, they'll eventually write Shakespeare, like Moby Dick. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. If you put a bunch of monkeys in a greenhouse long enough, they'll cultivate magic mushrooms. Man, just get me a monkey. It's all I've been asking this podcast That's one, for years. one monkey away it's, from... It's got to be an ape, guys. Come on. It's me. Yeah. So anyways, back to ecology, uh, not monkeys. Back to ecology. He's uh, straightening his glasses. It's freaking yeah. dark. Yeah. Fucking nerds. But sorry, please go on with the very interesting talk on ecology. Yes. Mm, yes. So the thing here, I think, is that like ecology became this like philosophical... like basis or argument about how we lived and how do we organize and decenter humanity and our needs and our interests to make space and kind of reorganize society with the things that are not human so that we don't kill the planet even if they weren't thinking on that size or scale at the point at that moment they were very aware of the fact that like if we're disrespecting the ecology and the landscape it kind of bites us in the ass so the question really became like, how can humanity exist in um, like more harmonious ways? So I'm going to go ahead and say Americans didn't really love this idea. Yeah, I mean, based on our food system now, you could probably take that away. I guess the takeaway for us here is that Rexy wasn't quite sexy enough to sway the population. Which is odd because that's how people pick their diets now. It's based on who's sexiest to prove that the diet works. Like the Got Milk commercials? No, that was Big Dairy. I mean, it was Big Dairy, but do you remember like the ads of like the milk mustaches? Yes, I do. So I do want to back up a little bit. To fully under like appreciate what this like change in perspective meant, we really have to understand how scientists understood the field of ecology, which was like very little. So I'm going to go way back. If you can recall back in the first episode of this podcast, we had discussed the framework of complex system science. Yeah, what's up, Tom? Mr. Wessels, how you doing, boy? Wessie boy. The Wessie boys. So we talked about the Macy Conference, right? And this was a big deal. It was the first interdisciplinary science conference that really started this idea of understanding what was then called chaos theory in 1941. So, you know, we're starting to kind of bring these these timelines together right so we're in the 30s now we're talking about 1941 so a few years after what rex is doing is when this idea of complex systems like started to like formulate right 
of course, like the idea of complex systems wasn't entirely new. It just didn't exist really in science. But that's why, as you're going to see, people like J. Russell Smith became so good at ecology and understanding these ideas, right? Like, why do we keep having people like Rex, who is an economist, J. Russell Smith, who is an economist, all these people that are economists under being so good at this, like, ecology side of things, because it already existed in, like, the economics, like, sphere. So, like, and I know people are going to be mad at this name coming up, Ludwig von Mises uh, had extrapolated this kind of idea of economic systems, being basically saying that economics is just like too complicated for any centralized power to effectively measure and distribute it. And while there's things we can argue about that conclusion, the main important here is that economists at the time, like Tugwell, like Smith, all these folks that came from economics and found an interest in soil and ecology and all this stuff, understood the foundation of complex systems, even if the terminology didn't exist yet. So the infrastructure of economics and ecology kind of follow this like similar path of like part philosophy, part hard science. It was a space that basically allowed like smart, hard science type people to become like creative, right? And trying to figure out how to picture like hard linear science as it was considered at the time, like this domino effect, and then fit it into like a more complex and creative system, right? Basically to this point, ecology was just a quasi unscientific study of plants. And that like plants affected the soil and affected what ate it. And like, that was basically it. Ecologists understood into the 20s that, like, this idea of, like, succession existed in terms of ecosystem. Like, you know, the idea of, like, an early stage old growth forest. They understood that. And to kind of reinforce this point, they also used a lot of economic language to try to explain these processes. So, for example, like, what we call today an ecotone used to be called, like, a superorganism, which is, like, kind of a play on the Marxist term superstructure. I mean, it's really easy to forget that Marxism was understood as a legitimate science by academics across the political spectrum, like before the Soviet Union. It's interesting if you go into like a lot of old catalogs, most colleges, if not all colleges, offer degrees just in Marxism, like not like Marxism as a part of like critical theory or something like that, like just Marxism. And that just seems wild today because there's like almost none. I feel like Marx would have hated that. Oh, he absolutely would have been like, what the fuck, guys? Do not create a class called Marxism, you fucking idiots. Yeah, all this means to me is it sounds like they were at a point in the, uh, their understanding of ecology that people could just sort kind of say what they felt it was and be creative with kind of how they got to that point, as well as make it up like where they were going from there. Yeah, I like, basically. Like philosophy pretending to be science. Yeah, I mean, to an extent. Like, fundamentally, the science was still, like, really topical and linear. Through the 30s and into the 40s, as we get into what happens going in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this was fundamentally being challenged as researchers kind of realized that stuff like succession wasn't necessarily a progression, but rather changing conditions, like when we talked about fungi. I don't know if you guys remember. And, like, how come soils change mm -hmm. bacteria to fungal ratios and stuff? that is changing conditions, which are more or less ideal for specific species. And it's not that there's a linear progression and that like these species co-evolved to be able to fit into one part of those changing conditions, right? Not to generalize, but to specialize in one part of it. And in fact, it wasn't until 1939 that the discussion that animals had even co-evolved for specific ecosystems and were even like necessary for plant health was even developed. Like, the idea that like a deer evolved for certain like ecosystem habitats was like totally foreign. And again, today this seems like common sense, but and it's like it's hard to believe that people were at one point unaware of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you said it right that it's like what see I guess just because we'd like taught it from very young. Yeah. You I... know, like this this idea was such like a paradigm that like even science education, when we're like 
you know, an elementary school sort of starts to build these ideas. I guess, but still at the time, I mean, the good book was pretty prevalent and all of that shit gets explained in like Genesis. So maybe they didn't True. ask why. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, when I started asking why I came up with, you know what, we are stoned apes with a weird version of alopecia and people who say they don't like mushrooms, they just don't want to evolve again because it's so taxing and they already don't have hair. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's just my, that's just, that's just my like idea. Hi, shit right now. <laughs> Hi, dear. I like it. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is it really helps like contextualize how and why conventional agriculture wasn't really seen as a bad thing, right? Like today, it's like obviously the idea of like growing 50 acres, 100 acres, 1,000 acres of crops and like that's it, just corn year after year after year after year without doing anything and expecting it to produce more. We understand that's like a bad thing, right? But it wasn't as obvious then. Our basic understanding of ecology and how ecosystems and soils and plants worked was fundamentally flawed as we talked about with like when we talked about F.H. King, right? Like their understanding of soil science was so horrifically off that like it's very easy to understand why they thought things could just go on as they were forever. And like that's not an excuse or anything, but like we clearly fucked up basically. And it's not an excuse because like people around the world continue to grow food without even having the capital S science, right? Like indigenous people around the world could still grow ethically uh, sustainably and so on. And they didn't need to get to this point of science in terms of like abstract concrete knowledge to be able to do that. Right. So it sounds like they had a general understanding, even though it may have been way off. Somebody or I guess the consensus came to be, could we understand this better? And then I guess looking at it under that microscope, you have to go back to, you know, uh, the basic building blocks. And when you do that, you start to build that complex system. Yeah. And I also feel like that I get why conventional ag wouldn't be seen as bad if you had like, you know, you didn't have a very in-depth understanding of it. But it's also like if you go, if you go and like see a healthy forest, like people, people sort of understood that like a healthy forest supports like more life especially when that like wildlife in the forest also helped feed you. Yeah. I mean, I think like the reality is that people just assume that like, well, I don't even want to say assume. I kind of think like the boomer mentality, right? Well, it's working for now. So why wouldn't it keep working? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that like really was like the, the undercurrent of a lot of this is that people are just like, well, it works and it's convenient. So like, you know, don't question if it ain't broke, don't, or if it's not broken, don't fix it kind of thing. Even though it was, basically eating at the savings bank of the soil health, right? Now, one more name I want to bring up, A.G. Tansley. Uh, he was a particularly vocal ecologist and advocating for change for our conventional monocrops. He was also increasingly uncomfortable with uh, an ecology that just placed basically old growth ecosystems as what human management should be measured against. Since like humans were never, we, di we didn't ev evolve in old growth ecosystems. We, we evolved in something very different than that. And instead, he argued that what our management practices should look like should be measured against what we do know and what we are evolved for, right? So like thinking back to like what we were talking about with sexy Rexy and conservation, the idea of like no humans in the landscape wasn't really a, a solution, especially if the goal is that like humans aren't the antithesis to nature, right? The... The position that Rex took was that humans should be closely linked to the soil from an agricultural standpoint, but not from an ecological standpoint, that humans needed to move off the landscape uh, so that it could be conserved, which is like in direct juxtaposition to this idea of like creating healthy ecosystems that we live within, right? So like there's this really obvious fracture in our relationship with food and ecology as like these two separate things. I mean, by modern context, Rex's ecological position would be considered wrong, but like any conservation at the time was considered fairly radical, right? Like, regardless of the politic. So, are we going to cancel them for being wrong about stuff? I mean, we can. We do have the technology. Well, I really want like an old school stamp and an ink pad that says canceled and just run around canceling folks I disagree with. 
But to get back to A.G. Tansley. Good, uh, good, strong two initial first name or two first initial name. I just thought of attorney general, but it's not that. It's the everlasting immortal two initial science guy name. Yeah, that's, where, that's how you know they're legit, right? Tansley suggested that um, we consider something of a, what he called an anthropogenic climax a modern landscape shaped by humans, something similar to the landscapes which once existed prior to colonization here in the United States. Dun, dun, dun. So like, my point is that this, this is like a very early precursor to the way we've seen ecology and human-based landscapes kind of evolve, right? This is, this is the beginning. And up to this point, the idea of ecology was like explicitly focused on this idea of like wild, like rewild, non-human involved. And this is where we start to see this division come up, right? We have these very like contradictory positions of what ecosystem support restoration looks like. At the time, these were considered different subjects entirely, and that the knowledge that you might get in ecology didn't necessarily apply to farming, for example. I mean, it's hard to understand now how that's even possible not to have that connection. Well, I mean, to quote Jen Rummy, there are unknown unknowns, and there are known unknowns. So the wild was an unknown unknown, and farming was a known unknown. I mean, I guess that's also just very much how like colonization treated the landscape. Yeah, a bunch of unknown unknowns. Yeah. And if you haven't, yeah. uh, everybody go rewatch The Boondocks for real. It's one of the best shows ever. If it makes you guys feel any better, in this case, while the farming people and the agriculturalist type people agreed with this sentiment, a lot of ecologists were very aware of how ridiculous it was. In uh, December of 1938, the president of the Ecological Society of America, a fellow named Herbert Hansen, advocated for a need for ecology to, and I in quote, invade the realm of agriculture and conservation. Now that's an invasion of ecology I can get behind. But um, Now it wasn't until the 1940s where application of this idea of like, ecological principles were actually introduced to like this idea of agriculture, right? And this started with uh, a f another nice, I know I told you guys I wasn't adding any more names, but here we go. Edward H. Graham, who wanted to reform a lot of the pest problems in orchards. And um, his idea was that if you cleared the litter from beneath fruit trees, it would help with like stopping pest cycles. That was based on like understanding how the pest cycle in ecology, right? And while this isn't particularly important, it's like the big overall picture. It gives you a really good sense of like how slow and incremental the idea of like applying ecology into agriculture really was. Yeah, not E. H. Graham, huh? Why are we even talking about this loser? Really, Andy, I, 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 I thought you would have filtered out these these first name, initial, last name people. Yeah, I mean, Dom cut that all out. Yeah, not important. Uh, <laughs> so ultimately, what came from this? from like ecologists and economists working together and then like trying to engage with like f agriculture was uh, a fundamental philosophical way to think about our ecosystems and what really our place is on the landscape, right? What we might call today like a land ethic, a term that shows up a decade later and not coincidentally was probably being written around the same time was uh, Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac. And while Leopold's work is the one which history remembers today, he was just one of many ecologists and conservationists like Paul B. Sears, who we had talked about earlier, who had advocated for the same thing. I think we talked about Sears in the last episode. What was fundamental, though, from like Leopold to Sears and even like Kropotkin in the Soviet Union was a desire to find a way to solve the endless ecological collapses taking place, and in many cases for both of them, also peripherally economically, in Kropotkin's case, more economically, and trying to basically look to nature to find an answer, which is why, like, if you read Kropotkin, he's always talking about evolution in Darwin, because it was about looking at ecosystems in the natural world as a framework for how humans should organize. Yeah, so I guess this is at the point where people stopped thinking in like linear, or I guess it would be like a pyramid shape, and they started to sort of think like cyclically. Is that a bumper sticker? There's a bumper sticker in that somewhere. I got to figure out how to put that yeah, together. That might be the one. Pyramid, less than sign, 
loop circle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. everyone will get it. It's true. It People like circles sense. more than pyramids, yeah. unless they're aliens. Then they really, really do love those pyramids. Commercial. They they fly in on circles. <laughs> they they fly in in spheres, and then they build pyramids. Never mind. Cut that commercial. I want that to go in the episode. Um, now commercial. Hey, we're taking a quick break in the episode to remind you that you can get a whole lot more information from poorproles.com. On our website, we have access to our supplemental reader for the podcast, which provides more depth and context, as well as thorough citations for all of the stuff we talk about in the show. You can also sign up for our newsletter, which updates you about limited releases, such as various nursery stock that we sometimes sell through the Poor Proles website, as well as updates about new merch that we have. You can also support the show through that website, poorproles.com, where you have access to our Patreon and our Substack to get early releases for articles and episodes. Now, if you enjoy the show and are just looking for even more audio content, go check out Tomorrow Today, which just wrapped up season one, or tune into the Gastropocene, which is a project of myself and Dr. Aisha Khan to discuss the way our diets have driven the Anthropocene and what it looks like to use our diets for good. Now, back to the show. I hope you guys like just really love what Elliot said about they have circles and they fly to us for the They fly the in in spheres and they build pyramids. Yep. The circle of life. They only move in a straight line, linearly. It's all the shapes. We covered them all. Circles, triangles, straight lines. The big three. Every single thing on the earth can be built with those three yeah, things. Yeah, I'm thinking fifth dimensionally, man. I'm pretty sure I just elevated. I think you're actually floating right now from your chair. My feet aren't even on the ground. Oh, man. Hell yeah. So um, basically what what they're all trying to do, what kind of underscored everything they were trying to understand and develop a, a framework for or from was what had caused the state of everything. It felt like the world was collapsing. Humanity throughout this industrialization of the 19th and early 20th century, we turned humans into parts of the machine, right? And then we were trying to turn nature into part of the machine that could continue to produce and produce with fewer inputs. And that ignored the complex resources that made nature's existence capable of producing anything at all. Sears had argued that ecologists were effectively there to, as he described it, pick up the pieces of our lost relationship with the natural world and to, in his words, unquote, offer laws of community and development and behavior in such a way that they may be applied not only within the human community, but within the wider community of living things whose control he had assumed. And that's, I'll end that quote right there. What we can really take from this is that ecology really hadn't fully formed its identity around what ecosystem restoration looked like. It was still those very early steps in trying to figure out what it meant to have ecological solutions to solve the issues that the present and the future had. And um, as we're going to see, these kind of end up falling into a bunch of different categories. We'll see, you know, the organic movement springs up a few, two decades later, permaculture three decades later, agroecology somewhere in that same time period, the regenerative movement multiple decades later, biodynamics and so on. Like we see all these different visions come from this really elementary understanding of ecology and humans and food systems and what what does it look like to try to bring all these into this into alignment right i think we, at this point we've started to see how these different visions begin to untangle from one another based on certain personalities in these different movements uh not in the podcast necessarily but just people that are listening to are probably familiar with all of those movements and we're going to see how these differences become more obvious as the podcast continues over the next seven or eight episodes and i will we'll take a deeper look at this throughout the this series okay so i'm starting to pick it up um because we've talked about it many times before the concept of man and nature as opposed to man in nature so this is like seems like the time frame where they're starting to figure that out i mean that could also be the bumper sticker they're starting to think cyclically man and nature circle of life that's where that needs to come in the line. Can we have musical bumper stickers? Is that an option? Like, you know, you have like the Christmas cards that it can open up. We can do scratch and sniff. You can't open a bumper sticker, Andy. Like, you know, 
I mean, it doesn't have to be opened, but like maybe when light hits it, it's like solar a motion, powered. You want a motion activated bumper sticker so when people walk by your car, it starts singing songs. You want to have like yeah. animated ads on the back of your car. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Are you going to put that talk, talking fish in the back of your car? Oh my God, that'd be amazing. That would be like, have fun. You, have you? Yeah. Have you seen the 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 um somebody reprogrammed like six of those talking fish to do what's it called the 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 songs? What do they call the Matt? shanties? Your your hip, yeah, shanties. Why is that your hip? <laughs> because that like is, is like, like a TikTok thing. thing. Oh. You know what I mean? Like now it's like a thing on the mm-hmm. internet. But I'm glad you picked up like me shaking my arm back and forth meant shanties. Yeah. So I'm I'm actually impressed. Anyways, so that's the thing you all need to look up on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it is the kids use these days. But to get back to this, so this idea of like ecology and farming, right? This is all really important to understand because interest in the permanent agriculture movement throughout the 30s started to fade. And that was for a number of reasons. So I want to kind of back up a little bit, put everything we've talked about on a very simple timeline so that we can understand the last three episodes in a couple sentences and watch how this has evolved. So like 1932, FDR was elected, right? So we talked before, I'm not going to go back further than that because we covered a lot, but like within a short period of time, it can become like really complicated to follow the, the linearity. So 32, FDR was elected, put together this team of people that he wanted to like make this vision happen. For the first like three or so years, like a ton of new programs were rolled out some of which were successful, like the Soil Conservation Service, while other things like the Resettlement Administration existed unsuccessfully for a few years and either shut down or were folded into existing programs. Because we're talking about soil and the fact that it's the government, nothing you know, happens on a dime, right? So really what we saw is from like 1935 to 1939 is when most of the application of these programs really went into effect. And like we had discussed with soil conservation, many of the parts which were successful were wildly successful. Now, like the resettlement administration may have failed in their visionary ideas of like community, but they were really successful at moving farmers from places where the soil had been destroyed, like Oklahoma, to like places like California where they could begin growing food again, right? And that kept them employed, happy, and so on. I mean, big, big asterisk on employed and happy. During that time. Yeah, I mean, the happy part. They they were alive and feeding themselves and not starving to death, all, all that <laughs> stuff. You know, we saw a bunch of soil get restored, all the stuff we've covered. However, as the late 30s rolled in, the Dust Bowl ended and rains began to return to the plains. And if there's anything anyone listening to this podcast knows, if there's one thing you know about Americans is that we are driven by immediate need. And once the Great Plains was in better shape and we could start farming it and there was rain, why the fuck would we want to develop a long-term sustainable food system? It's not, a, it's not important anymore. We, we can go back. Everything's fine. The interest faded. I mean, building a long-term sustainable food system seems kind of boring, you know? Yeah, and it's the most American thing. Like, we had forefathers, and they had all the foresight, so what the fuck do we need it for? Yeah, it worked for them. So basically, once we restored enough soil and got the farmers to work again, no one gave a shit. Like, everybody just forgot that it was a problem. Yeah, basically. Except for nerds. Well, it sounds like the recipe for a golden age. You do what you got to do now, and let the future deal with their own problems, which were actually your problems swept under the giant rug of time. Yeah, and I mean... As we're recording this, talking about the consequences of the decisions at the end of World War II playing out in real time, don't know what you're talking about. So one of the challenges, too, was as the late 30s and the early 40s was winding up, we're also seeing a, a rise in anti-communism and you know the Red Scare. We did talk a little bit about some of the failed policies. There's other failed policies we haven't gotten to go into detail we're going to do that in a, uh, when we start talking about Russell Lord, about some of the failures of FDR's repayment programs and things like that. I didn't want to make this any longer than it had to be. And basically, the issue was that there was enough fodder for people to go after when it came to like trying to attack big government. Typically, you know, with the idea of like we need less government so that the rich can continue doing the shit that they do. And then, of course, we had like the rise of fascism starting to come up during the late 30s, early 40s with with Hitler. And um, 
this became like a very big looming threat and suddenly it wasn't it was much less important to care about like soils being healthy and being more prepared for global catastrophe and being ready to feed ourselves and prepare for war, basically. And we covered this a bit with the the corn episode, if you remember, Elliot, where we talked about like they, the government was just like, here, here's money. Grow as much fucking corn as you can. So I won't really rehash that there, uh, here again, because we've talked about it. But basically, the war effort meant, like I just said, producing as many calories as possible. And we grew as much as we possibly could as quick as we could. Yeah, so it's kind of like, I guess I will equate it to something that I'm familiar with, like a smoker, when he has his first bad day after quitting, goes back to old reliable, what used to work for him. I'm two and a half weeks off the ciggies, and I can smell things now that I wish I couldn't, but I don't want to go back to smoking cigarettes. Proud of you, buddy. Yeah. Fast forward, we're not going to talk about the World War period because there's really nothing to talk about. 1946, our buddy Paul Sears, the forgotten version of uh, Aldo Leopold, there was a, a conference called the Food and Future Conference that he spoke at, and uh, he delivered a new vision of agriculture from a global ecological perspective. While the movement was dwindling, I think this is really a, a great speech and really interesting, given the context of how things go into the future. Right after World War II, he opened it with talking about Darwin and Kropotkin, and he you know, thanked them for providing a biological framework for the ethics humanity needed in order to make sense of what at this time, the post-World War II era, post-Great Depression, you know, all these things that have happened, uh, like an unraveling world, right? What Sears said to the audience was, and I quote, our responsibility now has two facets. We are custodians of ourselves and our environment as well. We do not make and cannot change the laws under which we must work, but at least we can understand them, end quote. And basically what had happened is during the 40s, while the permanent agriculture movement lost all center role in what the future of our food system looked like, the science and ethics behind ecology had developed. And they had become this very central component in how permanent agriculture had evolved. And we're going to talk about that with the Friends of the Land movement that Russell Lord was involved with. Basically, what this meant is that folks who were involved in this movement continued to be, and they continued to be invested, while the people that were kind of there to cash in had been long gone. Basically, the science continued, even if the flair had been since lost. So permanent agriculture was better defined as the pairing of ecology and agriculture. And the permanent part of that didn't necessarily mean perennial, but rather a permanently healthy soil and ecological community with a relationship to the land. Yeah. And it's at this point that we start to see the very early stages of that split between the movements that we see today. Like I said, agroecology, permaculture, organic, biodynamics, all of this really comes from the ashes of the failure of the Roosevelt administration to capitalize on this moment. The only time you'll be mad at someone failing to capitalize. Yeah, because the only thing that I'm capable of capitalizing is the first two initials of badass motherfucker science people. Science nerds. Oh, yeah. The point is that like this makes sense because as ecological knowledge was changing, basically what we saw was like these attempts to infuse like the empirical science that was very limited and a mix of like common sense and mysticism. And that was kind of the basis for like a lot of the science. So there's a lot of like leeway there for how you would understand stuff, right? And that gave way to what we now think of as like the new age qualities to parts of the movement, which like Almost all of those examples that we just went through are permaculture, organic, biodynamic, like they all kind of have that little bit of new age part to them. Even if you don't subscribe to that part of it, it, it exists basically in all those movements. And that's kind of where like that thread comes from is like this period where it was kind of like very in flux, right? But what's important to understand is that in 1946, the idea of like needing to change our food system was no longer really a big consideration, right? Because what happened was we had World War II, there's the post-war slump, and instead of dealing with the slump, they basically just moved all our infrastructure to fertilizer and skyrocketed how much we produce for fertilizer and, like, grew a shit ton of food. So, like, for context, from 1946 to 47, 
fertilizer manufacturing skyrocketed from 800,000 tons to 17 million tons year over year. It's a 2100% increase. That is fucking insane. And that was because of all the research that was put into chemicals and technologies for the war efforts. And that fundamentally changed what farming looked like basically overnight. And the idea of permanent agriculture like had no leg to stand on. It seemed entirely backwards. And the idea of like a planned permanent agriculture was like seemed silly in the face of like mechanization and scaling up. You gotta keep the uh, economics machine running. Yeah, and instead of drill, baby drill, it was grow, baby grow. By the 1950s, like they, they, we had these red scare moments, especially like sexy Rexy. But like at the 50s, post World War, the red scare was in like full swing. So we had folks like Assistant Secretary of Agriculture Clarence McCormick, who argued that the growth of the agricultural sector was an issue of national security and not some utopian agricultural movements. Like you can already see like the, the anti hippie kind of talk happening. And he argued that, and this is, I think, the last quote I'm going to drop in here. The world today is a battlefield upon which two ideas, democracy and communism, are fighting for survival. It is our particular job to help American agriculture to a position where it will be able and ready to do its full part in meeting any threat against the security of our nation. End quote. Okay, I love it. So democracy, a method of organizing politically against communism a method of organizing economically, they're against each other. No, nothing nothing wrong there. No, I mean, why would you think that these are different subjects? And I guess that's why you should uh, never let them tell you politicians were smarter back then. Mm-hmm. Hey, we had a president get stuck in a bathtub, and I think that was a peak, not a valley. No, that's true. That's fair. Like, I mean, honestly, I would respect more politicians if they got stuck in tubs. I mean, I'm sure that- with the aim if they were open of our about politicians, it. I'm sure it's a weekly occurrence in Congress. Yeah. I mean, a, a fall in a tub would kill most of them. <laughs> they don't talk about it, though. Like, I want to know who got stuck in a tub this mm-hmm. week. That is what CNN should be doing, the hard-hitting research. I mean, that's the, the news people want to see. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. We can all unite around, like, watching Joe Biden get stuck in a tub. Well, I don't know if I want to well, see that. I don't want to see it. I want to hear oh, about okay, it. okay, yeah. Or maybe like some blurry photos or something. Mm -hmm. So we've now watched like 10, 15 years of history pass. Now, even like future President Truman, who was a huge advocate for soil conservation right on the heels of World War II, the programs that he even supported were taken apart piece by piece, either by becoming voluntary or so underfunded and decentralized that they were basically unenforceable. As uh, the generation of farmers that had lived through the Dust Bowl had kind of passed out of the field, the idea of like unimaginable growth was the proof needed that the American way was the only way. We saw these methods played out. Remember, we talked about Erna Bennett, Ephraim Hernandez, uh, Green Revolution for Africa. These were all sold on what we just talked about, this post-World War II growth and the extension schools that we had talked about. All of the things that we've exported came from this trajectory. And we sold it as this is the the first day of the rest of humanity, that food will never run out. And to an extent, that was true because the damage is done from the last 80 years and the knowledge lost will forever shape what the future of humanity looks like. Golden age. Problems are for the future. Okay. Um, that That is the bumper sticker. That That's the one we need to do. <laughs> Yes, fucked around, f- found out. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I hopefully this was uh, an interesting, maybe even eye-opening story in a history that I think like I until I'd started digging into, it, I'd never heard of it, and I've been in this space for a long time, and uh, it's a reminder of how close we were to actually having a world that like reflected what I think a lot of people listening to this would love to see and would have been more than happy to see. And like I said, it's a story that's, I think, been largely buried, and it's really worth considering, like, what worked and what failed and why. And then again, how is this going to fit into this longer history of permanent agriculture and permaculture and biodynamics, organics, and so on and so forth? Like, all of this kind of ties in together. Now, for folks that are struggling to remember things we talked about, there is a text version up on our Substack. It's free, poorprolesalmanac.substack.com. And uh, there's some great resources, so if you want to see 
more in-depth information. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Next week, I believe we're talking about Russell Lord, a journalist who is more than just a journalist, who's very intimate with the Roosevelt administration and did some really cool stuff in the 50s and provide some really interesting context to a lot of what we talked about and also was like really close friends with Vice President Wallace. Man, the more you know. Or the more you know. The more who you know. I'm just, I, I still think it's wild. All the corn that we grow and we still don't have like ethanol engines that just run on corn well like corn juice in part i mean they're, they're just cutting like 10%. the good they're, they're, they're cutting the good stuff with corn i, I want like why, why not like 90 10 the other way well all you gotta do is build a uh, is build a corn cob gasifier and you can you can run your car on biogas that sounds hard I, i'm gonna try it i mean they people uh I mean, talking about World War Two, people ran uh, people ran cars on wood and all sorts of shit. Oh hell yeah! There's a great episode of um, what was it War Wartime Farms? Yeah, on Wartime BBC. Farm. Yeah, they were gasifying coal. Yeah, yeah, it was freaking great. I saw a guy made a steam powered lawnmower. That was pretty cool. I'm pretty sure I sent that to you. I think you did send it to me. <laughs> Man, steam powered lawnmower. That sounds. It's very, it sounds uh, dangerous as fuck, dude. Cyber. What's what's the opposite of appropriate technology? <laughs> oh, it's very cyberpunk. Low tech. Or is it cyberpunk steampunk. or is steampunk. that like steampunk? That's mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. Yes, this is my steam powered fucking lawnmower. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. That was a thick uh, series. We dropped a lot of lot of info. A lot of shit. Unlike the uh, the shit getting dropped on our fields. Yeah. Or something. It's fertilizer. Unlike them, chicken poo. We're dropping shit all over the place. Mm. All right. Thanks for listening. All right, boys. We'll yep. catch you guys next time. We're done here. Here on the Poor Poles Almanac. Peace. Later. Later.